guys, Payam here from Niche Advice. I thought we'll talk about some live issues that we're seeing right now within the market. These are customer interactions that I'm having on a daily basis. So if you are someone who's looking to buy a property as a first time buyer, a home mover, or an investor, this information is vital, guys, because I am literally sharing other people's experiences, okay? Experiences with new builds, experiences with first-time buyers, experiences with tenants and how the buy-to-let sector is working, experience on a lower property values, people looking to buy properties up in north, up in the Midland, what's happening with that? My own experience of buying a property before the 2007 crash and I bought an overpriced property, how that worked out. And we can look at some of the sort of uh, trends that are happening within the market. I've put all of this stuff in a, uh, in a field below um, so you can do quick links if you're just interested in certain topics out there. You can just click to the topic. But let me know what you think, guys. Let me know. Let's share your views with me. Do you agree with me? Don't you agree with me? What was your experience of buying a property or if you're looking at buying a property right now. So I'll catch you on the video and hopefully you'll enjoy it. Hi, it's Payam here from Niche Advice. Hope you're well. Right, let's talk about the market. Um, so honestly, I did, a, I did a quote for a client of mine on a two year fixed, uh, it was just coming up uh, for a remortgage and the rates are amazing right now, okay? Um, I, do you know what? I regret myself. I I tied myself into a fixed rate mortgage about a year and a half ago, or just before the pandemic, really. Um, I fixed myself, and I think the rate was one point five nine. It's a five year fix, one point five nine for my own residential mortgage. I reckon I can get the same rate now, same deal, probably at one point two on a five year fixed, something something around that. So, um, but certainly on a two year fixes. I've seen them drop below 1% now. So there are plenty of lenders out there that are now sub 1% on a two year fix. That just tells you how competitive the market is, how cheap money is to borrow. Um, and you know, we are getting more and more clients saying, look, um, you know, I'll, I'll take the hit, I'll go on a two year fix and then in two years time I will refinance. Um, there's still a lot more cautious people and I think there is good evidence for it to be a little bit more cautious. We saw inflation figures, uh, the UK inflation figures sort of rise and we have seen globally, even in the US, figures have risen. Um, you only have to go to the supermarket, you only have to do some DIY to uh, to work out you know, how expensive things are now. I had a builder, builders doing some work at one of my properties and uh, he said to me, I used to uh, buy a sheet of, um, sheet of wood uh, for about £16.99 um, and now it's like £38, £40. So that's how much inflation has kicked in. Now there are certain reasons, Brexit's got some part of to do with it, but supply chains and delivery chains and stock levels globally um, are under pressure. So what you've seen is prices go up and I think that will be reflected into everything, everything we do. And that will eventually catch up with Eventually, I think, you know, we'll probably have to have a, an impact in the way the Chancellor is going to look at interest rates, for example. So there are some pressures. Now, you know, from what I watched and read from the US side of things, and I think, you know, we still have to look at the US because they've got such big influence on the global economy. The Fed is sort of saying, look, this inflation situation is going to sort of settle down. But... Um, you know, I, I think, you know, some of those price rises are here for a while to stay and maybe um, as inflation, as the economy start growing and as the economy start opening up, there could be some pressures there. So um, from an economy sort of perspective, you know, and, and certainly from a security perspective, long term fixes are quite good. I wouldn't say 10 year fixes. There's not many out there. Seven year fixes is one or two lenders, but certainly on a five year front. There's a lot happening there, and I still think they're very, very competitive. And, you know, depending on where you are in your uh, cycle, and I've done a video on this, whether you go for a two-year fix or a five-year fix, and I will leave a link up here. Um, but, you know, greater level of security. If you've got, if you know your security is there, if you know that your loan-to-value is not, not bad, it's a good loan-to-value, then, yeah, maybe it's worth taking a two-year fix and then taking the gamble and then maybe in two years time but I've got a feeling maybe in two years time we're going to be in a completely different place so um, yeah it's it's certainly and it's 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 something that clients need to 
consider themselves. Obviously, we can give you the facts, we can give you the information, but it is really a um, uh, interesting decision to make right now. And like I said, I made a, a decision uh, a year and a half ago to go for a five-year fixed, but I don't know. Well, it probably wasn't the right decision, and you know, coming through to it because I could have probably got a much better deal now if I was coming up. But you know, you don't lose a lot, and it's not that much difference in the payments. And I've got the security that I can sleep, and then I have got some properties that are on variable rates. So what I've done is I've basically uh, spread my risk. So I've got some on a fixed, some on a variable, some on uh, a tracker. Um, so that's what I've done. In terms of the uh, the market, guys, is so interesting. So I've got a lot of clients at the moment that have missed the stamp duty deadline and they're going through the process, okay? Now, they knew that we're going to miss the stamp duty deadline. Um, the biggest things that I'm seeing is new builds, okay? Be warned on new builds. Uh, I've seen certain developers drop their prices massively for existing clients. So, for example, the value has gone round and said, we don't believe this property is worth, I don't know, for example, £400,000. The next day, that property's dropped in £20,000 and the value has accepted it. So it just shows how much fat there is in that deal, how much they are taking. And what you're finding with those first-time buyers, uh, sorry, with those new build stuff, a lot of those are first-time buyers. First-time buyers that are being pushed and hurried and forced forced down the line in some cases, okay? So if you are a first time buyer and you're negotiating on a new build property, please bear this in mind, guys, that first of all, a lot of new builds are overpriced, okay? And, you know, don't be rushed into these developments. Don't be rushed into, you gotta go with this guy, you gotta go with this, you gotta go with my solicitor, you gotta go with my mom, and rushing you down this deal. Get some time to think. Don't just put your money down. Don't just put your deposit down. Don't just, you know, buy what they're telling you. Oh, yeah, there's 20 buyers waiting for us to, to take this property. And if you need to take this property, you need to put your money down. And you need to commit. Where's your decision in principle? They hurry. They hurry these people along. Okay. And, yeah, I, I, it's a trend. And I've seen that with some of my clients. Okay. So this is experience from you know, people that I'm dealing with right now. So, and I've got nothing to gain uh, by giving you this, you know, it doesn't matter from my perspective, okay? For me, it's a figure on an application form, okay? Whether it's 20,000 pounds more, 20,000 pounds less, but I'm telling you, there is some problems there. I don't think um, some new, some, I have to say some, some new built uh, clients are being treated fairly by those overzealous sales staff. So that's what I've seen. Um, buy to let is still very strong. Um, buy to let, um, look, as people have started trying to look up north or in the Midlands for greater yield and you know to develop their buy to let portfolios, I'm coming across crap properties. Frankly, crap properties. So these properties are getting downvalued. They've got structural problem. They've got you know problems with damp, problems with rot problems with movement, problems with the way they're structured, problems because they're commercial or next to commercial facilities. I had one the other day, Blender said no, it's literally opposite a warehouse, next to a warehouse, lots of commercials on the, on the building. There's properties on auction, though, they've got some problems with leases. So the stock that's out there is not great, especially at the lower end stuff. Okay, so what happens is the buyers think they're getting a bargain. The lenders, surveyors go there and go, it's a piece of crap. Then we've done a load of work and basically no one wins because the lenders are not willing to lend. The buyers still want to buy because they're inexperienced. They haven't, you know, they're, they've been used to properties in Finchley and all of a sudden they want to buy a property somewhere which is worth 70K. This, they don't know the market well. They're trusting sources. They're trusting estate agents. And all of that stuff is, sometimes it works out well, but I'm seeing a disproportionate amount of crap properties in the market. And that's pretty much everywhere. But what I would say is, is, is generally the ones that are under 100K, 
okay and I'm, I'm seeing a lot of that and a lot of those things are falling by the wayside for various reasons generally property related in terms of the structure of the property or clients are buying a property and they want to convert it into this that and the other so a lot of those type of deals are still being done but what we're doing is we're pushing them down the bridging route because simply the mortgage lenders in that current state are not willing to lend okay so what happens is you've gone from a 25 percent buy to let uh, deposit to probably a 30 to 35 percent bridging finance because bridging the way bridging finance works although they'll say they'll do it at 75 percent loan to value by the time you added up all the cost and bits and pieces it works out to be 30 to 35 percent uh, loan to value so and a greater level of cost so there's probably a couple of thousand pounds more cost involved well a lot more cost involved than a traditional buy to let mortgage so all of a sudden those keen buyers are looking they're, they're getting more hesitant uh, about the deals so that's that um, tenants um, huge problems with tenants in the market um, uh, uh, basically people not moving out uh, tenants refusing to pay rent um, there is uh, huge issues around that one of the best ways to protect yourself is to get a comprehensive general insurance policy that has got rent protection that has got legal expenses cover because you will need it and why wouldn't you get the best insurance policy a lot of those costs are actually business costs so they can be taken off your profit so really uh, you would be mad not to have that um, in place especially in this current climate where um, you know there are problems you should always get a good really good general insurance policy anyway um, some of the signs uh, around that is obviously looking at the excess levels and looking around the policy itself what it does and does not cover the legal cover and the rent cover also if you're going to go for the rent cover you've got to be watch out you've got to see how um, the how you did the referencing was the credit checks done was the initial referencing done by an estate agent if it was by you make sure you double check all of those things before um, before you commit to a policy because different insurers have got a different way that they would want you to have referenced that tenant in the first place okay before they can pay out on that policy so um, watch out or, uh, around that um, in terms of um, other things that I'm seeing here um, there's a lot of issues around bank statements right now okay so let clients um, sorry lenders are giving a great level of attention to bank statements now that or that is because uh, first of all they want to make sure that you've got the money that the, the money that you you say you have coming in but also from an expenses perspective they want to tally things up often I'm getting bank statements now that I've got not showing any utility bills any bills at all what that tells us is they've got another account so they're just sending us one account now the lenders are saying now we want all bank well they always used to to be fair um, they want to see all bank statements so if you've got two current accounts one with you know a joint account maybe um, the other one with yours we want to see both of them because um, that's a very telling way of seeing what's happening is there stress is there financial stress within the accounts um, are there other things that you haven't disclosed really um, that maybe the credit check has not picked up um, so is there sort of you know maintenance going out things like that, that the, 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 the credit checks don't pick up um, is there large commitments coming going out or and also large money coming in um, generally if it's over a thousand pounds lenders would want to know what that's for so these are all um, things that I'm seeing in the market um, we're seeing a lot of uh, pressure certainly around the the first-time buyer market now um, in terms of you know uh, because of the lack of stock I'm still seeing prices um, you know they haven't come down I've seen some properties come down certainly around London um, but the stock is not there there's you know speaking to one of my clients yesterday and he said look I'm in all honesty whatever we're seeing there's a problem with it so if it's a nice house and he's got a decent house maybe the the rooms are small a little bit too small or you know you're gonna go and pay six seven hundred thousand pounds and it doesn't have a driveway and when you look at the car when you look at the road outside it's bumper to bumper so all of those sort of things he's going look you just can't get everything you know I said well you've got to make a compromise he goes yeah but these, these are big compromises if I've got two children and I don't have a driveway and I look outside and it's bumper to bumper um, that's not an area I can live on but 
that's the area that I want to live on because of maybe it's near to the train and bits and pieces. So um, what I will say is everyone recognizes what a decent house is. You know, everyone recognizes what a decent property is, you know, whatever they want. But the problem is there's not that many of them around. And the ones that are around that people are selling, there's often problems with it or they get snapped up very, very quickly. Okay, so, um, and there was, a, there was a survey that came out yesterday to say, you know, 50, over 50% 50 of the people that bought in the last year, they regret paying what they paid for it. Now you've got to take these surveys with a pinch of salt. I think, you know, at the end of the day, uh, those people that have committed and they've paid for things, um, they've done so and, um, and I think they'll probably over the long term, that we're looking at what property has done over the long term, they'll probably still do well. I mean, I, I personally bought a property just before the 2007, 2008 crash. I paid 324,000 pounds for it, not in a great area. And I bought this property, it was a three bed semi. And I remember I must have paid about 25,000 to 30,000 pounds over the odds. And I remember my brother-in-law was talking to the neighbor and he, we were doing some decorating there and stuff. And he said, I can't believe you paid that. I cannot believe you paid that sort of money. You know, these properties are not going for that much. Um, you've basically got mugged off. And I sort of said, yes, you're right. You know, at the end of the day, I did pay the property, but I knew the area. I knew that it was the location was okay. I knew I wouldn't lose money on it. Um, and 10 years afterwards, I sold the property. Now, I told my brother-in-law at the time, look, I'm buying this property, f not for the next year, not for the next two years. I'll buy it for 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, whatever it is. I'm buying it as an investment. Now, that could be a residential, you're investing in yourself, you're investing in your family, or you know, you're buying this property longer term. So I said, I don't care if the property's gone down two years. I don't care if it's five years, six years. I'll keep hold of it until I need to sell it. So. I ended up selling that property for 465,000. So I bought it for 323, four, and I sold it for 465. Now, you gotta look at it two ways. So I made some money on the way, great. I, saw, I kept it for about 10 years. But if I had bought in a decent area, a good area, that property would have tripled or doubled, okay? It went up by 100K, okay? 150, whatever it was, okay? But it wasn't double, it wasn't triple. Now, if I literally bought that property a mile, mile and a half down the road, it would have tripled, okay? So you've got to look at it. In one case, I didn't lose money on it, but certainly I made some money on it. By the time I've paid my tax, my capital gains tax and stuff, it wasn't that much money in terms of, you know, the bigger scheme of things. So I could have bought in a really decent area and, and tripled my money, but I didn't. But I wanted the security of buying not such a good area, but being able to rent that property. So there's always there's always risk and reward there. I bought in an area which firstly I could afford at that time. I didn't want to overstretch myself at the time, but I also wanted an almost guarantee because it wasn't a great area. It had a very good rental yield, funny enough, a rental yield. So I made money on it for 10 years and then I sold it okay because I needed to sell it because I was buying a residential property at the time so I needed to get rid of my actually I, I bought residential but I wanted to what I wanted to do was reduce my debt in total so I sold that property I think bought a car bought bought my mortgage down okay my own residential mortgage down so that's a strategy so it's not just about oh, I've doubled my money it's about rental yield Buying in an area, yes, I could have done a lot better, and in hindsight, I should have. However, I went for the safer option, and um, there's an argument to say, you know, the safer option was the best option because we went through the last crash, and that property was always rented throughout the crash, so I wasn't left hanging. Um, anyway, guys, I hope you've all well. I just wanted to sort of give you a little bit of an update on everything, and uh, yeah, let me know your thoughts. Let me know your thoughts around buying, whether you're a first-time buyer, next-time buyer, or you're a buy to let investor. Thanks a lot. The content of this video does not constitute giving advice. It's purely for information purposes. All cases should be discussed with a professional mortgage broker. As a mortgage is secured against your home or property, it could be repossessed if you do not keep up mortgage payments. Niche advice is authorized and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority.